Shalom, shalom, and welcome to another 1C22 online streaming service for a beautiful day in May. We are getting through every single day. Uh, remember the scriptures say, give us this day our daily bread. So regardless of what happened yesterday or what you think might happen tomorrow, be thankful for this is the day Yahweh God has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen? Uh, very brief on the announcements. Um, minor setback, minor setback on the uh, prayer room, but God willing, that should all be fixed by this week. Um, because it's amazing how it seems like this is being literally stretched out. God knew how much time we'd actually need to get this thing done. But... Um, Keep praying for the finality of the completion of the prayer room. And we are now actually entering into the uh, furnishing stage. Um, I, I, I've had, I was in the meeting with uh, Pastor Ryan and uh, uh, Carolyn this week about the furnishing room. Um, there are requests for donations for, I mean, we're looking for couches, chairs. Um, and when I say couches, chairs, I'm not talking about... Uh, uh, your second cousin's baby's mama's couch that ha might have a few stains on it. Uh, we need like, listen, listen, this is the prayer room. You know what I'm saying? Where we're trying to enter the holy of holy. So we don't want a holy couch like with holes in it. We want a, a sanctified couch, but not a couch with holes in it. Amen. So um, if you have uh, furniture, it will be at our discretion. So don't get your feelings hurt if your, your stuff is rejected for the prayer room. But nevertheless, um, if you have decent sanctified furniture that you would like to donate uh, to the prayer room. Uh, like I said, couches, chairs. Um, we are putting in, you know, sound system. We are going to have everything from uh, acoustic guitar, piano, gym bays. We're going to have all that stuff in there for people who want to worship the Lord. But at the same time, um, we do uh, want to also have things that if people want to sit down and uh, a couch not for going to sleep. Okay, but just just offerings we are looking for, just like, you know, when Moses built the temple and then the people brought dedication to the house. If, there, if there's anything that you feel like is qualified for the prayer room that you don't need, uh, please submit it to um, us here and we will take a look at it. Amen. God bless you. Well, let's get into the word. No, notice we are definitely um, in a prophetic season with um, everything that's happened since Passover. And we have been looking at the gospel, as 1 Corinthians 15 declares it, that uh, the gospel, that you're saved if you keep in memory. First of all, Christ died. Uh, Christ was buried and Christ resurrected. And as he reiter reiterates twice, according to the scriptures. So um, in this theme of the resurrection. We've gotten through the uh, crucifixion. So we talked about how Jesus was crucified during Passover. We talked about the burial aspect. We talked about the removing of the leaven. Um, um, and so now we are at the, the, the resurrection reality. Um, as 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verse 20 says, Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruit of those that slept. So what the uh, past few weeks, even though we were talking about Passover, it goes to first fruits. And we've got into what I call the second first fruits. Father, as we get into the word tonight, we ask, Father, that the revelation, the reality of the resurrection of your son would penetrate every heart, mind, and soul right now. In Jesus' name, I just deny the power of the flesh and ask that you allow me to, to minister in you, Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Christ has risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those that slept. Skip down to verse 23 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He says, but each one in his own order, say order, Christ the first fruits, then afterwards those who belong to Christ. This is why James 1.18 says, He birthed us through the word of truth that we may become a first fruits. So it's always curious to me when you know, Gentile New Testament believers talk about how this, you know, all the Jewish stuff and that's got no, nothing to really do with us as Christians and every single concept 
that the new covenant is talking about is birthed in the old covenant. So first fruit, literally, you are referred to as a first fruit. So as we were looking at the Numbers 28 uh, in juxtaposition to Leviticus 23, Leviticus 23 hammers out those seven feasts. Uh, Numbers 28 uh, uh, brings up something in verse 26. And he says, also on the day of first fruits, when you bring a new grain offering to Yahweh at your feast of weeks. So feast of weeks is where we connect the second first fruits. So in Leviticus 23, it says, when you bring a first fruits offering to Yahweh God, that what happens is the priest takes his first fruit and he waves it before Yahweh for the purpose of it to be acceptable on your behalf. But this says in Leviticus 20 in Numbers 28, verse 26, on the day of the first fruits, when you bring a new grain offering, because the first first fruits and the feast of weeks is what I refer to as the second first fruits. Now, how does this connect again to the new covenant reality? As uh, note uh, in Acts chapter two, it says when the day of Pentecost had fully come. Well, Pentecost is the feast of weeks. Shavuot, say Shavuot. The, the, the Hebrew word for, uh, for the, the, the Hebrew word for weeks singular is, is Shavuah. The Hebrew word for weeks plural is Shavuot because it is the feast of weeks. He birthed us that we may become a first fruits. Feast of weeks is what I refer to as the second first fruits because that's when you bring a new grain offering to Yahweh. So when Pentecost has finally come, or when Shavuot had finally come, is because now all of the weeks had been counted down or accounted for. Verse 2, suddenly there came a sound from heaven like a mighty wind. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues. Now, I'm not going to get into the, the depths of Shavuot and Pentecost and uh, first fruits because that's what the last uh, three weeks have actually been about. I've been very detailed, very specific, so um, if you are curious about that, um, please, uh, whether you go to YouTube or the, or the, the Facebook, 1C22 Church Facebook page, um, those, the, the previous recordings of those teachings with verses and references and details have been on that. But I want to make sure that we focus on, in these next few weeks, what I call the Star of Pentecost, the Star of Shavuot. Who's this actually all about? They were filled with the Holy Spirit. John chapter 4, verse 24, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Make no mistake about it, as I've been challenging people, make sure that you're spending your time wisely, and that time is in preparation, in expectation for the Shavuot blessing, the, sh the coming of, of, the, of, of God's power, God's anointing that took place in Pentecost or Shavuot. This countdown officially ends on May 28th. That evening, sundown May 28th, will be when Shavuot or when the second first fruit has fully come. So you have a few more weeks. If you haven't been praying in expectation for the Shavuot blessing and for what God wants to do during these opponent times. And what do I mean when I say Shavuot blessing? Listen, God is the, this is the day God has made. We'll rejoice and be glad in it. He's the Lord of every day. So we're not here worshiping a day, but when Yahweh talks about these festivals in Leviticus 23, he says, Haim Moadai, they are my feast. But specifically, it literally means his appointed times. So yes, God can bless you at any time. So I'm not trying to get on that train and make people think that God won't bless me unless I take the, the, the Pentecost blessing seriously. But what I'm telling you is there is something unique about God's appointed times. I call that just, just extra blessing, extra time for extra blessing. Amen. So God is a spirit. So when I referred to early as the star of Shavuot or the star of Pentecost, who is the actual star of Pentecost? It's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who makes it happen. So it is no coincidence that out of all of the things that people think they need, they think 
They need a mask so they can go to the store. They think they need a, 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 a vaccination. They think that they need a, a, a counseling session because of all the depression and anxiety of just being cooped up. Or they think they need uh, more advice from the government. But what they need is the Holy Spirit. What we need more than ever is the Holy Spirit. And I am not um, apologetic about these statements. We have all of the, 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 the technology we, we, we need. We have all of the information we need. We have all of the drugs we need. We have all the entertainment we need. But what we don't have is enough of the Holy Spirit moving in the way that God wants him to move in our life. We need more of the Holy Spirit. So as God in his sovereignty shuts everything down, allows things to be shut down and says, hey, I, he wants to reopen with the glory of his spirit. God is a spirit and they that worship him in, 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 must worship him in spirit and in truth. And I say this all the time on purpose. There's a lot of, of jargon going around where they're calling it, uh, well, you believe in God. Well, I'm, I'm not religious. I'm just spiritual, spiritual. True spirituality is what John 4 says. Those that worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. You take away the truth, then you don't have spirituality. You simply have sensuality. True spirituality is not simply worshiping God the way you want to worship him. You worship him in spirit and in truth. And God is reminding God's people and God is re reminding this earth that there is one true God and there's one true spirituality and that comes by his Holy Spirit. So tonight, um, I'm going to break a few things down just to make sure that we are literally in the flow of the Spirit. And not according to what I've said, but according to what God has said about his own Spirit. In John 16, 13, Jesus says, when he, the Spirit of truth has come. So again, they that worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. The Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of truth. He will guide you into all truth, not partial truth. This is why I'm very, uh, uh, very uh, specific about people telling me the whole truth. And I will purposely annoy you. If you're giving me part, part of the facts, you're omitting certain things, the Holy Spirit doesn't lead you into some of the truth. The Holy Spirit leads you into all truth. You need to be a person that doesn't just say some of the truth and conveniently emit out details that either make you look good or that make the, your situation look better. You need to make sure that you are not manipulating the truth. The way that you do that is that you walk in all truth. That is what the Holy Spirit does. He leads you and guides you into all truth and he will tell you things to come. The prophetic reality, what people want to know is what is going to happen in my future? What is going to happen? Actually, the Holy Spirit, his job is he will tell you that which is to come. And notice it is connected to the truth. So the, some of the reasons why some people, and I mean people in the kingdom of God, do not have God's direction, God's leading, and they're still foggy about the truth because they're accepting lies in the present. You cannot have a, pro a prophetic future lined out for, for you in front of, by the Holy Spirit. You cannot clearly understand what God is trying to tell you and show you about your future when you're accepting lies in the present. He says in verse 26, the helper, the, the parakletos, the paraclete, the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name. The Holy Spirit does not come in the name of Buddha. The Holy Spirit does not come in the name of Muhammad. The Holy Spirit comes in Yeshua, Jesus, Yahweh's name. He will teach you all things. So he's guiding you all truth. And guess what he does? Wait a minute. But I want my Holy Spirit blessing. Wait a minute. I want my Holy Spirit exaltation. Wait a minute. I want. Well, hold on. Before you become the head, learn how to be a student. He will teach you all things. And that never ends on this side of eternity. Never stop being a student. Always put yourself in this position of humility to allow the Holy Spirit to teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. The Holy Spirit will remind you of what he said before. So that means if you weren't paying attention the first time, there won't be anything to remind you this time. 
He will bring things, remembrance to what he said before you. If you're not learning, if you're not walking in truth, then all of a sudden, don't be surprised when your memory's a little cloudy. Don't be surprised when you can't remember certain things. That's a consequence of disobeying or disrespecting the teaching and the leading and the guiding of the Holy Spirit. He says in Nehemiah 9.20, you also gave your good spirit to instruct them and did not withhold your manna from their mouth. The Holy Spirit leads you and guides you all truth. They worship God, must worship Him in spirit and in truth. But what Nehemiah says, he refers to him as the good spirit. Yeah, we're about to switch it up. We're about to switch it up. We're going someplace tonight. The truth is, you cannot know what is good and true without the Holy Spirit. You cannot know what is good and true without the Holy Spirit. Here in Psalms 136, Give thanks to Yahweh God because he is good and his loving kindness or his mercy endures forever. You cannot know what is good or what is true without the Holy Spirit. Give thanks to God for he is good, Yahweh is good, and his mercy endures forever. And Psalms 143, verse 10. See if you can find the, uh, the, 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 the synonymous theme running through here. Teach me to do your will. You are my God. Your spirit is good. Lead me into the land of uprightness. Well, I just don't know what to pray during this time. Father, in Jesus' name, teach me to do your will. You are good. Your spirit is good. Lead me into the land of uprightness. You are God. Your spirit is good because God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Look at this in Romans 2, 4. Do you despise the riches of his goodness? What's the purpose of God's goodness? Notice what every single thing has been connected to God's goodness. It's leading you to uprightness. His goodness, he says in Romans 2, 4 says, not knowing the goodness of God leads you to repentance. I just want God to be good, okay? I want to experience God's goodness, okay? Here's the question. Do you understand the purpose of God's goodness? If the spirit you are following is not leading you to repentance, then you are following an unclean spirit and not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's job is to lead you and guide you to all truth. The Holy Spirit is good. He is a good spirit and is the goodness of God that leads you to repentance because Yahweh God is good. In case you have not caught the theme of tonight's sermon, it's actually going to be about good. What is good? There's a question that, that uh, Pilate asked Yeshua. What is truth? The reason why you can be confused about not knowing what truth is is because when you don't know what goodness is, then goodness cannot exist without truth. Because the truth is, God is good, but his goodness leads you to repentance. So when we're talking about the Shavuot reality, when we're talking about the Pentecost reality, when we're talking about the second first fruits reality, and the power of the Holy Spirit, and the anointing of the Holy Spirit, which, by the way, yes, in the next few weeks, that's exactly what I'm going to break down. Because that's what I like to do. I like to get to the, the, the prophetic reality. I like to get to the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, the gifts of healing, the power, the casting out devil. I Listen, in these next few weeks, we're going to get into all of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But if you do not have the foundation of the goodness of God is rooted in the truth of the Holy Spirit, then none of those gifts and none of those things that God wants to give you will be of any service for the kingdom. Understand. We need to understand the goodness of God. Understand. We need to understand the goodness of God. First of all, it is a good thing when God corrects you. It is a good thing when God rebukes you. It is a good thing when God keeps you from destroying yourself. The goodness of God leads you to repentance. So now let's think about that phrase, oh, God is good. Is his goodness leading you to repentance?
In Luke 11, Jesus says, if you being evil, knowing how to give good gifts to your children, good gifts, how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Good gifts, Holy Spirit. Notice, in Matthew 7, the writer is literally referencing the same passage. But he says, if you being evil, knowing how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? The Holy Spirit. Well, I mean, what, which one is it? Is the Father going to give the Holy Spirit or is he going to give good things? Yes, because the Holy Spirit is a good thing. God is good. His mercy endures forever. In this hour, and this is what I've been challenging my people in this hour, you better be on your face in expectation asking God for more of His Holy Spirit. This is the season to do that in expectation for the Pentecostal shout. Out of all the things that you could be asking for, out of all the things to be seeking, out of all the things you think you need, there's nothing that you need more than the Holy Spirit. You think it was, an, uh, it was strange for God to shake up the economy. You think it was strange for God to shake up uh, people's false sense of security and man-made medicine. But the Holy Spirit that leads you and guides you in all truth, he's good. He's going to teach you all things. He's going to show you what, which is to come. And one of the things he's telling me to make sure that he's showing you is that do not fear because he is in control. If you are more afraid of a disease than having faith in the word of Yahweh God, then you clearly are not being led by the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is not going to lead you into a pathway of fear and anxiety over things that God is not trying to put on you. He will lead you and guide you in all truth, teach you all things, show you that which is to come. But then he says, you being evil, knowing how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father not give the Holy Spirit to those who, wait a minute, ask him. This is why I've been saying for the last three weeks, uh, take this time and start asking God for the Holy Spirit, asking God for his anointing, asking God for the power of his Holy Spirit. But the thing that God is going to begin to initiate in your life is his goodness and manifest that through, first of all, the things that will lead you to repentance. Now remember what the Holy Spirit is referred to uh, in Acts chapter 1. He commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. Say promise. This is the promise of the Father. What was the promise of the Father? The promise of the Father is God was going to make all my dreams come true. The promise of the Father was God was going to open up every door that I've ever wanted. The promise of the Father was uh, John baptized with water. You will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So the expectation of the Holy Spirit is what I was trying to get across in the last few weeks. You should be expecting the Holy Spirit. But then what Matthew 7 and what Luke 11 is challenging you to do is says, how much more will he not give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? In these next few weeks that you have left, think about it. You could have had, and I started on day one. Listen, the first seven days, walk through your purification, feast of leavened bread, Call things out of your heart. Make sure, create in me a clean heart, God. Renew a right spirit. Walk through those things that purify your soul. But then after that, it is countdown and every single day asking God for more of his Holy Spirit and expectation. Because this is a promise. The same promise and the expectation that the people of God were actually expecting in the book of Acts. And to be clear, because here's what will happen with people uh, who are watching this and like, well, I'm saved. I have the Holy Spirit. Well, clearly you do. But are is all the fruits of the Spirit manifesting in your life? Are you maximizing and optimizing your prophetic reality? Because he said, I'll pour out your spirit upon all flesh and you'll prophesy. Are you prophesying the way God told you you're supposed to be prophesying? Are you flowing in all of your supernatural abilities that God has endowed in you? This is the time to get on top of this in this season. Yeshua promised you the goodness of the Holy Spirit and the good things that are included with him. Where I'm bringing you tonight is once you get past your own flesh and your own fears 
and you realize, wait, God is a spirit. The first thing you do, he's going to lead me and guide me all truth. You understand his truth leads you to his repentance, but then you also understand that the other side of that truth is so that he can give you good things. God is ready to give you good things. This is why I have not been, and I've told you guys on the first uh, the, the, I was about to call it episode. The first episode of 1C22 streaming. I told you guys on the first taping that I did. Listen, I'm not going to be here spending 20 minutes going over, oh, the virus. No, let's, let's worry about this. That is not my concern. My job is to preach the gospel and tell people about the word of God. And the reality is because the gospel means good news. And the good news is God is not trying to put a virus on you. The good news is God is ready to give you good things. Those who repent, those who turn to him, those who've been asking, those who've been believing, those who've been waiting, expecting, God is ready to deliver on his promises and let the church say amen. Yeshua promises you, wait for the promise of my father. Wait for the promise of my father. Yeshua promises you the Holy Spirit. Now, in 2 Corinthians 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, he says, the Lord is that spirit. But we all, verse 18, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image by the spirit of the Lord. The spirit of the Lord transforms us into the same image, the glory of God. You understand what you could have been doing if you haven't been doing in these last three, three, four weeks? Beholding the image, letting the Spirit of the Lord transform you into his image. Not into the image of CNN, not into the image of Fox News, not into the image of scared preachers that are not going to tell you that God is still good and he's still in control and sovereign of your life. Instead, take that time, take the rest of these few weeks, because again, stuff is about to open back up. That ark, the door of the ark is going to open. Come out being transformed by the spirit and the glory of God. In Psalms, it says Yahweh God is a son and he's a shield. He will give you grace and glory. Now watch. He's a son, he's a shield, and he will give you grace and glory and glory. We're transformed by the Spirit of the Lord beholding the glory of God. God says he'll give you grace and glory and then he says, Lo yimena tov. He will not withhold good from those who walk uprightly. He will not withhold good from those who walk uprightly. What's happening here? He's a son, he's a shield. He will not withhold good. Well, hold on a second. There's certain good things that I still haven't got yet. You're telling me God's not going to withhold good from me, but I'm missing a whole lot of good stuff that I thought I should have had by now. Because before he gives grace and glory, he's a son and he's a shield. What's a shield do? The shield protects you from certain things. In Genesis 15, 1, Yahweh God appears to Abraham and he says, the word of Yahweh came to Abraham saying, I always point that out. It doesn't say Yahweh came to Abraham. It says, the var Yahweh, the word of Yahweh came to Abraham saying. How does the word say? It's the word of Yahweh that came to Abraham saying, I am your Shield. Ani magain. Anochi magain. Anochi magain. I am your shield. Then he says, your reward is very great. Pay attention to the order. In Psalms where he says, Yahweh the son of the shield, he'll give grace and glory. No good thing will withhold from those who walk uprightly. But before we get into the good thing that he's not going to withhold, He says, he's a shield. Hold on. Genesis 15. Before he says, your reward is very great. Some translations say, uh, uh, I am your exceedingly great reward. 
But before we get to the reward, God reiterates, Ani anochi magain. I am a shield. So in Psalms 84, 11, and in Genesis 15, what can we learn from the order of how God is presenting himself? Listen, here's the reality. The devil wants you to believe that Yahweh is just trying to keep you from having stuff. The devil, that's why he always counterfeits stuff. That's why he's always trying to offer you the wrong before you get the right. Well, you might as well get this because God don't want you to have no fun anyway. God don't want you to have nothing. Look, if, if God wanted to have it, you would have had it by now. The devil wants you to believe that Yahweh is only trying to take things from you. When in reality... God is shielding you from something that is not good enough for you. Listen, my spiritual mother, I had a, had a young lady, a little situation. I was like, yeah, you know, talking to my spiritual mother. I'm like, yeah, you know, you know, she cute. Yeah, you know, this, whatever, woody, woody, woo. I just, I just want you to pray, you know, about us. You know, I want you to pray for God's plan. I want you to pray for God's will because that's what you want, what you want, right? You're, you're, you're saying, I want you to pray that it will be God's will, okay? Uh, obviously, it wasn't because uh, obviously I'm still single. So the point being, let me tell you why I'm still single. Because of what she said. Connecting to God is always shielding you from stuff. So after I get through with my little soliloquy about how great it was going to be, after she prays us together into the, in, into the will of God, she just looked at me and said, yeah, I'm just going to pray that she's good for you. In certain seasons, well, I thought you said God would not withhold anything. No good thing will he withhold from you. A good God does not want bad things sabotaging your reward. A good God does not want bad things sabotaging your reward. He is a son and he's a shield. He's going to protect you. He will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Anything God is withholding, it is for a a purpose, a person, a reason, whatever, a, a, an opportunity, a job, things that you think you should have by now. If you don't have it yet, it's not because God is simply saying, I don't want to give you nothing because I'm stingy. You have to ask yourself one question. Does a good God want to give good gifts or bad gifts to his children? So thank God, first of all, for his shield. Now, I want you to look at this uh, story in Exodus 33. Remember, this is the Holy Spirit is referred to as the Spirit of glory. The goodness of God, the glory of God. are all connected. So what he said in Psalms 84, 11, we got to the part at the end, lo, yimena, to, he will not withhold good from those who walk uprightly. But first he said, he's a son, then he said he's a shield, but then he said he'd do something else. He'll give chen, grace, and glory. He will give grace and glory. See, this is what I mean when I'm talking about the goodness of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God. Those things are designed to lead you to repentance. Once you get understand the grace of God, that leads you to the glory of God. If you don't prostitute the grace of God, you will see the glory of God. If you don't take advantage of the grace of God, you will see the goodness manifested through the glory of God's Holy Spirit. So 
So what he says in Exodus 33, now remember, um, God had told them like, uh, th this is right after the children of Israel had uh, done the, I uh, made the gold calf and all this garbage and um, there was some uh, strong words from God against the people of Israel. And uh, God, Moses has a conversation because he's concerned about God's presence. So you don't need to be here long at 1C22 to understand that the priority of this ministry is not my presence, it's not your presence, it's God's presence. However, the presence is manifested through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, presence of God. What he says in Psalms 51, when he says, Creating me a clean heart, O God, uh, they, they, they attest this to, this is the psalmist after David had sinned with Bathsheba. Creating me a clean heart, O God, renew a right spirit in me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit away from me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit away from me. Exodus 33, verse 14. When Moses is contending for the presence of God. Yahweh God says to him, my presence will go with you. Verse 15, Moses says, if your presence doesn't go with us, don't bring us up from here. The world is really focused on getting the economy on track. The world is really focused on all of the jobs being restored and all of the, the everything going back to normal. I don't want normal. If every job comes back and the financial crisis is averted and all of the economies of the world are fixed and God's presence is still not with us, then it's been a wasted two months. That's the problem. People still want more money than God's presence. People will sell out God's presence for more money. People will abandon God's presence for more money. Moses, knowing that I don't care what happens from this point on, we could get to the land of Canaan. We could get the, 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 the land of milk and honey. And we could have cities that we didn't build and vineyards that we didn't plant and groves that we didn't plant. And we could have uh, buildings that we didn't, we could have all this stuff. But if you, your presence is not with us, it is all in vain. So when I talk about the presence of God, make no mistake, it is not disconnected from the person of the Holy Spirit. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Moses contends with the presence of God. But then he says in verse 16, Exodus chapter 33, verse 16, How then will it be known that your people and I have found chen, grace in your sight, except you go with this? For the Old Testament sure is a lot of talk about grace. Well, you know, the New Testament about grace and the Old Testament about law. Uh, Moses clearly understood chain, grace. If you don't understand how Old Covenant writers clearly understood about grace and mercy, go back and read Deuteronomy chapter 9, where Yahweh tells them over and over again, it is not because you guys are so good that I'm doing this for you. Grace. Psalms 84, 11. Yahweh God is a son and a shield. He will give Cain, grace and glory.
So as this story continues in Exodus chapter 33, Moses, after contending for the presence of God, verse 18 says, Please, please show me your glory. Give me a community of people that will stay consistently on their face and just say, please, show me your glory. We want to see your glory. The Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of glory. Contending for a prayer room, contending for more intercession and prayer and fasting is not about some spiritual badge of honor so we can get prideful and arrogant. It's simply saying, this is what brings the glory. This is what connects us with the glory. He says, show me your glory. Then he says, for those who thought I've gotten off track, I mean, I, got, I thought this was supposed to be about God's goodness. Moses talks about the presence of God. He says, show me your glory. And look what Yahweh responds in verse 19 of Exodus 33. Yahweh says, I will make all my goodness pass in front of you. I'll make all my goodness. The name of tonight's sermon is Goodness Gracious. Goodness Gracious. God's goodness is gracious. In verse 20, he says, I'm gonna make, uh, um, uh, I'll make all my goodness pass before you. And then he says, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious to. Moses is asking for the presence. And God connects his presence and his glory with his goodness and his grace. He told, he lay along the hasdo, because God is good and his mercy endures forever. Even in the midst of a pandemic, God is good, and his mercy endures forever. If your business is doing great, if your business is not doing great, God is still good, and his mercy endures forever. Verse 20, he says, You cannot see my face, for no man will see me and live. And Yahweh says, Here is a place by me. You shall stand on the rock. Uh, in the Hebrew, he literally says, here's a place, E.T., which literally means here's a place with me. You shall stand on the rock. Here's a place with me. You'll stand on the rock, verse 22, while my glory passes by. I'll put you in the cleft of the rock, and I'll cover you with my hand while I pass by. Man, see the glory of God in this hour. To see everything open up. And instead of life being life, as usual, it is people who love Jesus and who are ready because they've been filled with the glory and they're ready to impart that glory to everyone that they see. The goodness of God. In Psalms 27, 13, you know, Psalms 27 is a lot of, a lot of praise to God. I mean, Psalms are a lot of praises. He's my, Lord is my light, my salvation. Whom shall I fear? And then he says in verse 13, Whew, I would have fainted. 
Lule, unless I had believed to see the goodness of Yahweh. Not when I close my eyes and go off to glory, but to see the goodness of glory in the land of the living. My expectation is I don't care what the television says. I don't care what they decide this week. No, it's going to be phase two. No, we're going back to phase three. No, we're going to switch. Couldn't care less. I am believing to see the goodness of Yahweh God in the land of the living. In these last few uh, verses. When you get to Joshua, verse 21, in chapter, excuse me, chapter 21, verse 43 and, and 45, there's Joshua's rehearsing the events that have taken place. And then he says, You know, in all your hearts, that not one thing of all the good things Yahweh sp spoke concerning you has failed. And then he says, Hakol Ba'u. He says, Everything has come to pass. Everything has been fulfilled for you. It is an undeniable fact that God is faithful to His Word. So when He says, not one thing of all the good things God has spoken has failed to come to pass, everything has been fulfilled for you, that was true. Because God is good. But God is not a respecter of persons. What He did for Israel, He will do for you. If you are in Him. If you are with Him. What He said to Moses. Oh, I want, you want to see the glory. But the problem is, you want to see the glory from your angle. You want to see the glory from your perspective. You want to see the glory under your circumstances. But what he said is, um, you need to stand on the rock. English translation say, by me. Hebrew, literally, you need to be with me. If you want to see the glory, you stand with me. When Yahweh graces us with his presence, the goodness of His glory will fulfill every good thing prophesied by His Word. Not one thing of all the good things that Yahweh God has spoken has failed to come to pass. Now remember, in the story of Joshua, you have an interesting leader who has an interesting perspective. Who is Joshua talking to? Joshua is not talking to the people that he grew up with. Joshua is not talking to the people that he spied the land out with. Because all those dudes died in the wilderness. Joshua has an interesting perspective. Yes, he made it. Joshua has an interesting perspective because now he's prophesying everything that God spoke concerning you. Because God did have a plan for the previous generation. And this is why I am very, very intent on speaking to this generation and the next generation because I want to see not one thing of everything that Yahweh God has spoken for this generation and for you fail 
to come to pass. I want to see not one thing fail to come to pass. That means everything that God has spoken for you for this generation and for your world to come to pass. And if you choose to believe the report of any other medium, that's on you. Because that's why only two of the 12 spies made it into the promised land. Because the other 10, not only did they not believe, but they spread the lie to the rest of the generation. And, and an entire generation lost the promise of God. Not because God was good, but because they did not believe in his goodness. So in Joshua chapter 14, because remember I said two out of the ten, because there was another individual who chose to believe with Joshua. And his name was Caleb. Caleb. So only Joshua and Caleb had a unique perspective. Because Caleb was right there with him. Recounting the events. Hey, remember Joshua and we, we, this land that we're possessing right now. Remember 40 years ago? Remember 40 days ago? <laughs> when everybody else was tripping and everybody else was paying attention to everything but the word of the Lord and everybody else was distracted. But you and me, Joshua, Yeshua, Jesus, Joshua, you and me, Jesus, stood together and believed in the goodness of Yahweh God, prophesying that we are well, well able to take whatever giants that are in the land. And then, 40 years later, Caleb is now 80, 85 years old. And he says, in Joshua chapter 14. I'm just as strong today, 40 years later, as I was back then when we first went into this land. In the last 40 days, have you has your faith become weaker or stronger? Are you still maintaining the grace and the goodness of God or have you allowed the events of this world and the circumstances connected to them deteriorate your faith? Deteriorate your strength in the word of God. And then he says in verse 12, Joshua 14, verse 12, Tena li etahar hazeh. Give me this mountain. I'm prophesying you today to those who believe in the goodness of God, that you have the right, once you get to the end of your season, once you've crossed over into the place God has called you to cross, once you've been led and guided by the Holy Spirit into all truth, you've allowed him to teach you, you've allowed him to guide you. There's nothing wrong with then asking God to give you your mountain. What does that mean? Fulfill the promise. The word that he spoke. Not one thing that God spoke will fail to come to pass. I'm not asking for someone else's something. I'm simply asking for what God has promised me. I'm not asking you to ask for something else that belongs. I'm not prophesying covetousness. I'm talking about the faith that believes in God's goodness do not simply give you a promise but then Fulfill it. The greatest promise given to this world was fulfilled on Calvary's tree when the King of Israel, the Lamb of God, Jesus of Nazareth, was crucified. The reason why there was a promise of the Holy Spirit was because the promise of the prophesied Messiah 
who fulfilled what Moses said would happen, that Christ would die and suffer and rise again. That he, like a lamb, was led like a lamb to the slaughter. But God did not allow his soul to rot in hell, in Sheol, in the grave, not the, not the fiery place, in the grave. Jesus did not decay. He did not allow his holy one, his chasid lirot shachat. He did not allow his holy one to see corruption, but resurrected him. And in that resurrection promise, because he resurrected, ascended to the right hand of the Father, then he said, I got a promise for you that I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. So I cannot tell you, remember what Jesus said, whom the Father will send in my name. You cannot and will not receive the goodness of the Holy Spirit without receiving the goodness of the Son of God, Jesus of Nazareth. And the purpose of his cross, the purpose of him dying for you, the purpose of him resurrecting you, resurrecting, the purpose for him being good to you was so that he could lead you to repentance. You turn from your sin. What do I mean when I say repentance? What do I mean when I say turn? Knock it off. Whatever you're doing wrong, knock it off. That's literally what repentance is. That's all. You turn around because it leads you to repentance. And then, but you don't just stop doing what you were doing wrong. Then you go to him who is good and right. And you come to Yahweh God, confessing your sin, confessing your need for a Savior, but confessing the reality of his redemption by believing that his son died for your sins. As Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, or that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. Now, when it breaks down, it says, because with the heart, one believes unto righteousness. In other words, it's just simply saying, it's not my faith that saves you. You have to believe that these words are true, that what Jesus said about himself and what actually happened is true. But with your mouth, confession is made into salvation. And to confess someone is also simply confessing that you believe that they are who they said that they are and that you are ready to follow them. And if you've done that, then you can expect the promise of his Holy Spirit and the promise of everything else that God has spoken over your life to come to pass and see the goodness of Yahweh God to Eretz Chaim in the land of the living. Yahweh bless you and keep you. make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Yahweh turn his presence, his countenance upon you and give you shalom in Jesus Yeshua's name. And I say again, may everything that Yahweh God has spoken of your life come to pass. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless your love.